Oh, good morning and welcome to the Moral Maze. Um, this is meant to be a little bit of fun and a little bit exciting and an opportunity, if you've not had that already, to uh, get up and state your positions and uh, your views on some of the kind of contentious issues that surround uh, new nicotine products and uh, tobacco harm reduction. I'm pretty new to uh, tobacco harm reduction. I worked in drugs harm reduction most of my life and then I discovered e-cigs about uh, four years ago and I thought they were um, you know, the key to uh, uh, helping people switch from smoking. I thought that all my public health colleagues would naturally agree with me and it would be straight sailing, but it clearly hasn't been. Uh, and I find the whole area endlessly fascinating as a social scientist because there's a kind of a, a turmoil and a turbulence going on uh, both in people's views about this new landscape. Uh, there's a turmoil for policy makers, there's a turmoil for public health. Uh, for the public, you know, what is the new relationship with um, nicotine? So I really think we're in, in, in a very interesting decade in which we are coming to new positions, new views, new ideas about society's relationship with um, nicotine. And there are all sorts of twists and turns that are challenging for people. Um, you know, tobacco companies perhaps beginning to act a bit like pharma companies. Um, tobacco companies which put products through medicines licensing, which means that my general practitioner could prescribe a nicotine product which is made by a tobacco company. And you know, how do they feel about that? We've got vociferous arguments, a lot of it's pursued on Twitter, uh, but you've got public health, sort of many people in public health a little bit um, how can I put it politely? They don't really like vapors. Uh, vapors would like to like public health, but they feel rebuffed by public health. Uh, both sides sort of sling arguments backwards and forwards. If there's one thing that unites public health and vapors is their distrust of the tobacco industry. So lots of different conflicts and issues um, going on here. So uh, the idea today is that we explore some of those um, issues. And to help us kick this off, we've got a very distinguished panel who are going to each speak for around about five minutes to, uh, to say what it looks like from uh, their perspective and from the area in which they work. And I've forgotten in which order we're going to speak. It's going to be okay. Linda first. So Linda, Linda, Joe, and Martin. So Linda, um, uh, Professor of Health Policy, uh, at the University of Stirling. I first met Linda when I was on a tobacco harm reduction working group for the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And I was quite surprised to find so many tobacco. I thought going there, nobody would really have heard about harm reduction. And of course, everybody on that committee sort of knew what it was all about. And uh, Linda guided us through the twists and turns of, of that. Martin um, uh, Dockrell leads on tobacco control in public health England. He's a civil servant, and when he's in England, there's a one second pause between every word he speaks because he's always wondering a little bit who's going to be looking over his shoulder, and he might want to remain a civil servant, but I'm not really sure about that. But Martin also has a background in AIDS, and that's very important because that kind of experience of AIDS and public health, I think, is beginning to inform what's going on in public health England. Joe, for public health people, um, Joe is on the sort of the double dark side because he works for Penny Associates who are consulting both for pharma and for the tobacco industry. Joe's also got very strong views about this. Big energy is in the room. Right. <laughs> he takes contracts for big energy as well. Big oil. <laughs> big oil so <laughs> but as you know, uh, <laughs> Joe... <laughs> And what about um, FIFA? <laughs> There's a job going there. <laughs> Uh, but Joe, as you know, is very independent-minded and independent-spirited. So, uh, and then we, we've got Jean-Francois Etter, who actually knows much more about ethics and morals and moral uh, and uh, policy science than I do. And Jean-Francois is going to be the first respondent. Then we're going to open it up 
to all of you, and it can be questions, but it can be comments, statements, contentious points, and so on. So but let's have a lively, uh, lively morning up until around about 12.30, 12.40. So, Linda, over to you. Okay. Would you like to stand or are you happy No, I think we've decided we'll all just sit on the sofa. Okay. Everybody's happy with that. So thank you, Jerry, for that introduction. So I'm going to say a few words uh, as a researcher, as an academic. So uh, leading a research team, I'm also going to talk as a funder because I chair the main tobacco control funding committee in the UK um, and also as a journal editor. Those are three roles that will be very common and familiar to the other researchers in the room. So. I think the last few years have been fascinating because I suppose, probably Martin and I, maybe both of us, but we come from a tobacco control tradition and I've done tobacco control research on topics that many in the room don't agree with, things like standardized packaging, for example, um, and then other things that probably everybody thinks are potentially a good thing, like helping pregnant women stop smoking. But some of the things that I see at the moment that I would describe as barriers, maybe, and facilitators to research are the following. So I've, I gave a few minutes thought to this. The first one is, if we think about tobacco harm reduction um, and the devices we've been talking about at this conference, what's the research agenda? If you look at other areas of public health, we have more consensus on what the main questions are that need to be asked. And in this area, the really tricky issue is what should traditional academic teams be doing in universities and what's the industry doing? What are the questions that you're answering in your labs that we maybe don't need to be bothering with because you're doing it anyway? How do we find out about that? That's a tricky issue. That's not the type of communication we've normally had. So there's a lack of research agenda. Um, the second issue for us is ethics. There are multiple ethical issues and problems with conducting the kind of research we'd like to do on e-cigarettes, nicotine vaporizers, and other devices. So you've all heard about Article 5.3. There are many of my colleagues who won't even interview uh, somebody employed by uh, the industry, even to some, in some circumstances, not just the tobacco industry, but potentially the e-cigarette industry. How do we supply the products? To, our, uh, to participants in our studies. What will the funders allow us to supply if it's a tobacco industry manufactured product or not? That's a big issue for us. And a third issue is most of what's happening, of course, isn't in the health service. This isn't about health services, it's about consumers and communities. So how do we best do research there? And then the other issue is design and do we know enough? When will we have enough evidence to be able to be confident about policy? Um, some of my colleagues, uh, I think the position they're adopting at the moment is it could take forever until we know enough and so we won't do anything, which isn't very helpful. The third issue is speed. Things are changing so quickly that those of us sitting in academia, take, it took me three years to get ethics approval for my trial of financial incentives for smoking cessation of pregnancy because the committee hated it so much. It takes a long time for us to do these studies sometimes and a long time to publish them. And meanwhile, the world's moved on and people ask, why did you bother in the first place? And then the other issue is public involvement. So we're all supposed to involve the public in our studies, but my public health colleagues are deeply suspicious of involving potentially some people in this room and elsewhere in our research. There are developments like the new Nicotine Alliance in the UK that's now a charity. It's actually much easier for us to involve vapors in that group in our studies, and Lorian, who's not here, she's in the other room, but she's now helping me with two pregnancy studies, which is great. And then for journals, this is such a new area. How on earth do we find the reviewers to look at the studies who can be trusted to say anything sensible? So that's really hard. And I, the Young Investigator Award, Chris, who was here, but we need to make sure that we get more early career fellows involved in this. And then just a couple more points. Values is really difficult. So some of the people who I have collaborated with for almost 20 years now, this is the one issue we don't agree on. And I just feel that they can't move away from their preset positions to embrace what I think is an exciting and new agenda. And then I guess the last couple of points I'd make for researchers, sometimes we fight about the difference between what's right for an individual and what's right for the population. And Martin might feel that in public health, their job as public health officials is to look at the impact of changes on the overall population. And sometimes that gets in the way of thinking about what's best for an individual. So it's how do we balance those two? Now, in a best case scenario, to achieve effective public policy, I think researchers and the vaping community, um, or researchers need to act as the bridge between public health and the vaping community, in a way as knowledge brokers, and fill what is often an information gap. 
We've got some developments on that, but we need a lot more of it. So those are some of the some of the challenges without going into lots of individual examples. But hopefully that sets the scene for what the others are going to say. Thank you. Gosh, that's rather a lot. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, thank, thank you very much. I think we're going to be here all day. It's good. Uh, okay, Joe. This was one of two sessions that I w knew I wasn't going to be able to escape from. Uh, and uh, Linda's remarks highlight how I maybe should have reconsidered the wisdom of the decision to uh, stick this one out because once again I'm on a stage with people who know way more than I do but first uh, a confession um, and you know not everybody in this room is who needs to hear this uh, there are people outside the room it's something that's um, it really kind of came up earlier this year and uh, it's kind of been rumbling along and then it really some of the discussions and thinking uh, today, uh, over the last 24 hours, really had it uh, come clear to me. So, if you all will um, accept my uh, confession of sin, um, it is that I didn't think about what I was going to say until this morning. Um, and I then moved with the alacrity of a cat and sent out to the Jonathan Haidt uh, Moral Foundations of Liberals and Conservatives on the Twitter. Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands of how many people actually watched the 19-minute video, but please, uh, before too many moons pass, please uh, do that and view it with a lens to uh, the situation we have here. Um, what you thought I was going to say was my disclosure that uh, in February we signed up with uh, Reynolds American Inc., which is uh, a cigarette company. Uh, mostly, but also a total nicotine company across all delivery forms of nicotine. Uh, and uh, we also, so that's our consulting gig. We also have, uh, I <coughs> own a small interest in a nicotine gum that uh, a part of Reynolds has taken an option on. So I have uh, many financial interests and uh, on the second one, my main interest is uh, getting a bank to stop bothering me. Um, the, uh, I thought I might just walk through what was m my, and then I had the good fortune of having trusted long-term colleagues to uh, not have to uh, think through these questions alone. Uh, but let me just say that if you look at uh, the public uh, filings, which I'm sure everyone does because it's thrilling reading from Reynolds American, they state that their goal is to essentially change the uh, nicotine marketplace in the U.S. And um, what I trust about them is that they are eager to grow their shareholder value faster than their peers. And they believe and have evidence to support that the way to do that is to have the marketplace not be dominated by combustible tobacco. So when they came saying that and saying, we want your help to do it faster, again, so they can make more money more faster for their shareholders, uh, the question kind of turned, so why wouldn't we do this? And the first thought uh, or feeling really is, um, which is very powerful to humans, go watch the height thing or read the books if you're old fashioned, um, is social disapproval. Um, how many people would not uh, talk to me anymore? And as folks who know me, I do uh, care deeply about my relationships with just about everyone, um, actually with everyone. Um, and that is a huge, that is a huge, so this is more the confession. So that's a huge thing. But uh, I then tried to think through and say, OK, you make this decision. And you say, thanks, Reynolds. Been nice talking, but we're just not going to be able to do it. And uh, I can imagine my 13-year-old daughter saying, hey, dad, what's going on at work? And to say, well, you know, your dad is 
you know, hubristic enough to believe that he could have maybe made a difference and have more people not suffer or die from the way that they consume their nicotine, but some people might not like me as much as they do now, so I decided not to do it. And that did not really feel like the kind of lesson I wanted to teach my daughter. So uh, I can't think of another reason, because I can't change the past. I can only change what I do today and think about what that does for the future. Um, and that's what I'm focused on. And I don't know how long that took, so I'm probably done. I could talk more, as, in case anyone was wondering, but uh, that's probably <laughs> enough for opening remarks. That's perfect. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. Uh, it's a bit. It's a bit like in the psychiatrist's chair. This, isn't it? You know, it's. Uh, oh, I, I, I already had a consult earlier today from a mental health professional going to save my marriage. Right. Okay. <laughs> Martin, over to you. What, it you gets worse, Joe. I wasn't talking does? about a traumatic <laughs> experience in my childhood. So, uh, so you all saw yesterday. I bounced off the stage uh, after the talk, and I said, "So, Joe, what did you think?" And he said, uh, "Sloppy seconds." And uh, he, he said sloppy second. I know. Um, but actually, uh, um, feedback is a gift. Back to Joe Gitzel. Uh, so, uh, so I'm used to that, actually, because about 30 some years ago, maybe, uh, I, 25 years old, I went to uh, my first international conference. Uh, and it was in Africa. It was an HIV conference. And um, half the panel on uh, needle exchanges and harm reduction for injecting drug users hadn't turned up. And uh, so I was, uh, you know, called at breakfast and uh, said, look, we, we need some more speakers for this panel. And, and uh, you know, th there's this guy uh, called, called Jerry Stimson, and he tells us that needle exchanges are really highly effective in reducing HIV infection among injecting drug users. And you run a needle exchange that doesn't work. So maybe you could come and tell us <laughs> why this Jerry's right and you're wrong. Um, and uh, so I, can, uh, I, I gave that my, my best shot. Um, and it started me on a, a kind of career path which uh, uh, demanded that I, I kind of always be open to the idea that uh, I'm wrong or wrong again. And uh, so that, that's been important for me. Um, and I, it, it's, it kind of lends a rigor. And I was all ready to go to another conference, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, and uh, to talk about... Um, how harm reduction is a, is a science, and it, we, we're not subject to the, um, the prejudices uh, that uh, harm eliminators, total abstainers, that ideological approach. Uh, and, and I was telling a colleague about that, said, really? Is that really what you believe, Martin? I said, a absolutely. Said, you, you don't recognize that actually harm reduction is sure, we value the data, but we're firmly based in values. And, and that values aren't a bad thing as long as you're open and clear about those values. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. So, um, uh, 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 and it's true, there are values uh, which, uh, for instance, I, I, I sometimes, Joe was going to talk about a number of continua that, that govern uh, our, our decision making. And, and uh, one for me is this kind of continuum in public health from we decide so you decide. There, there are times when I want my doctor to tell me what drugs to take and how much of them to take, how frequently and what not to take with them, because I value that expertise. Um, and there are other times when um, it's kind of um, not my doctor's job uh, to tell me uh, what to do, but rather to, to help me be informed to, to make my own decisions. So. 30 years ago, I would have told you all, I want you all always to use clean injecting equipment when you inject drugs and uh, never to have sex with the condom. Right, so 30 years on, I'm guessing probably not many of you uh, inject drugs and share needles when you do. But put your hands up if never in the last 30 years you've had sex without a condom. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, you really shouldn't have, but you decided for your own reasons. Uh, that the, the, the risks were maybe worth it. He was hot. You loved her. Uh, you were drunk. Uh, you were married. Uh, you were married to somebody else. Uh, there are all sorts of excuses. 
Uh, no, not excuses, not excuses. There the, are the reasons you came to your own decisions. So, so that's the kind of tradition. And, and, and when Linda said that uh, we came from a tobacco control tradition, actually, I came late to tobacco control, and I was, I was baffled by it. As, uh, you know, w we, we get people in the room, and we tell them what to do, when and how, and we tell them they must do exactly as we say. That's not the public health I was... I was from, so it, it, I didn't even like the, the term tobacco control. Uh, so it, it, it took a lot of uh, getting used to me, for me, and I still feel like a, a bit of a, a Martian landed in the world of tobacco control. Um, but that, that's not to say I, I hold uh, the views of uh, these colleagues in contempt. And, and Jerry, you talked about you know, views in tobacco control and views in public health and how uh, e-cigarette users view public health and how public health. I tell you. Public health colleagues, tobacco control colleagues, are as diverse in their views as my friends who use e-cigarettes. Um, and I'm really delighted to have community advocate organizations uh, like the New Nicotine Alliance. But I, look, I used to run a community advocacy organization for gay men. I know that I did not speak for all gay men uh, when I did so. So Linda talked about... Uh, the importance of uh, having uh, you know, users in the room, policy uh, makers in the room, and, and, and researchers acting as kind of intermediary, uh, helping us get this through the evidence. I see the relationship much more as a, a three-way relationship with, yeah, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> it's harm reduction. Uh, so uh, a three-way relationship where we, um, Actually, the, 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 the users will get really engaged in research, and not just read research, but maybe do the research themselves, where uh, the uh, policymakers not be so damn prissy and recognize uh, their own uh, patterns of behavior and the way that, that, that they're real people who have real lives as well. And, 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 and for, research, for, for it to be a real triangle where we kind of have a, a rich dialogue between us, and we uh, try and overcome those uh, professional boundaries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've heard the three speakers speak about values and also about the risks of uh, getting involved in this in in this activity. Seldom, I think, in our field, do we have the opportunity to have such influence on on the life of people through science and through regulation. And um, are we making our best? I, I think not. I'm appalled, actually, at uh, things that are getting published and reported in, in the media. We've spoken about conflicts of interest with the tobacco industry. Well, the, the worst science that is published currently and reported in the media does not come from the tobacco industry, actually. It comes from public health people, from researchers who have been involved for many years often in this field and have uh, perhaps not uh, thought deeply enough about what they're actually doing. As, for instance, Fasalino said yesterday, there are many studies that are designed to, produ to produce a toxic effect and then this gets reported as headlines in the media. This is doing harm and uh, so there's an urgency not only to conduct research of good quality, but to have a debate about values also, about uh, what all this is, is really about. And uh, there's a responsibility, I think, also for education. There's a need, for, there's a need to educate not just um, doctors, who also have misrepresentations ab about what is nicotine, about the toxicity of nicotine, about the relative risks of nicotine, tobacco, and smoking, but also uh, policymakers and journalists. And as long as we don't have a more in-depth debate, not only uh, on science, but on values, and, and a stronger effort to, to educate policymakers, journalists, about the nature uh, of nicotine. I think it's a, at the core of this debate is misunderstandings and rejection of the uh, uh, concept of harm reduction. In many countries, harm reduction is not accepted at all. I, I, I talked yesterday to a colleague from Russia 
who said that harm reduction, even in the field of uh, illicit drugs, is completely rejected by, by the government. So in, in this case, the government is doing more harm than good. The, 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 the worst harm to the population doesn't come actually from the drugs themselves. They come from the governments. The government imposes a huge burden of harm on people, on entire communities uh, within countries, and this has to change. This has to stop, and it's, it's a responsibility of everyone, not only scientists, but also the, the, the consumers, largely policy makers, to, to change this current situation because we are heading nowhere. We are, we are heading towards a situation where these products will be heavily regulated, they will be regulated largely uh, with punitive regulations that were developed over the years for tobacco products. This is really counterproductive. I'm not very optimistic uh, about the outcomes of these regulations, and this has to change. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all four of you. There's a whole long shopping list there of different ideas and issues. Who would like to... Um, oh yes, lots of... Marawa, you were up there first. Well, the first one I saw. There should be two people with microphones. Uh, we got our... Um <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, good morning, everybody. And um, that was really great. I'm Māori Glover from New Zealand. I just want to pick up on the values thing. And... Uh, I we, we live in, especially in the academic world now, a postmodern sort of secular society. And what's kind of been lost on purpose uh, is the value base of many people. So we've moved away from religious values and, you know, uh, and I guess um, I'm not religious, but I, I belong to a deeply historically rooted tribal people and we have been desperately resisting genocide and trying to hang on to our culture and our values and our language. And so I have Māori values to, to guide my actions. Now, in academia today, with this, uh, this sort of postmodern anything goes, all thought and ideas are of equal value, and so how does one then get their particular perspective to the fore? And it's no longer necessarily value-driven, and so we see this rise of a really a power and control struggle. And, I, and some of the shocking stuff that we're reacting to with the misuse of, uh, the, or the misrepresentation, the misuse of our scientific platforms, uh, and it, it's a kind of a bullying, a violence, and an abuse. And, and it's shocking to some of us who clearly still have very strong values about behaviour and what's appropriate and what's ethical. I think it is ethical and we need to have some very clear um, guidelines and we do need to bring it out about what is ethical behaviour for scientists. Uh, clearly some of our scientists and some of our consumers and n nearly everyone in that three-way relationship, there are people who are misbehaving and um, acting like they're in the sandpit. And we need to call it out. We need to sort of hold people accountable for that behaviour and say, hey, this is not useful for going forward. Uh, this is not ethical behaviour. And, um, and so that's why I like David and Ray's paper. And we need more of that sort of thing. Let's have some values. Let's have some guidelines, which you have from time to time said, please listen with respect. But we need to bring that maybe into the literature as well. And we need to call out the journals that are publishing this sort of rubbish. Um, and we need to just be careful in our own you know, forums that we're communing on, communicating within and, and events like this about the sort of snide and the innuendo and the, and the putting people down and, and just trying to sort of quietly discredit people and, and they're, you know, they're not really very good scientists and stuff like that. So I just think um, it really, the values is very, very important. It's going to be very important to, 
to highlight that more in, in going forward in this debate. Thank you very much. No, I, th I think we'll take three questions and then come back. I think we'll take... Um, uh, Joe will interrupt me and so, go on. Thanks. <laughs> no, you can, you, you can use one of my, and I didn't coin this, but a wonderful expression is, excuse me for speaking while you were interrupting. Okay. You can use that later on. I so, will. Uh, I, I did, uh, and I didn't coin this expression either. This is from a uh, retired three-star Marine Corps general who referred to academics as refugees from accountability. And I would say that is completely not fair to paint all with that brush. But I think looking, and I'm, for example, um, but I think it's fair to say, for your point about when is abuse of a, of a trust that is basically bestowed upon researchers, um, when does that slip the bounds of terra firma and what to do about it. And I would say then what to do about it for everyone, Santiana's quote that fanaticism is redoubling your effort while forgetting your objective and being prey to that myself and then noticing it 20 minutes later is not as good as noticing it five minutes before. Thank you. Notwithstanding Joe's fantastic interjection, what I would like to do <laughs> is to take maybe three comments and then we'll take that away. <laughs> we'll, we'll, <be laughs> we'll take three or four questions and, oh gosh, and then we'll see what the team thinks. So I saw Atakan, and keep the point, I mean, good and lovely speeches, I don't want to... You're so, the one that wanted input from, you were I, I know, Atakan, Atakan, a very, I know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Atakan Befritz. I work with THR in the Middle East and in Turkey. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question for Mr. Dockerell. Um, with regards to the comparison HIV AIDS, I would argue that is one of the examples, best examples we have in the world of a monumentally effective public information campaign from 1980s and onwards, especially so in the West. I'm a can you define something that really makes that different from the tobacco harm reduction issue that we cannot use, or that we do not use in public health campaigning? Okay, good question. Okay, drugs harm reduction, tobacco harm reduction. Catherine? Sorry, and there was somebody else, oh yeah, Lyles. Okay, and we'll take five then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, I'm kind of doing a bit of a cheaty, cheeky two-hander here. It's Catherine Dublin from Mesita. Um, I've got a question for Linda and also for, for Martin. Um, Linda, you would really, I was really interested about this, this notion of, of the difficulties and challenges in getting research um, grants through and getting committees to agree to agree to science proceeding in a particular study. I'm wondering, we're beginning to see uh, recently the emergence of some studies actually about the studies and the behavioral science of the behavioral scientists and the research scientists and academics. Do you feel that, there's, that, there's, that it's useful to have that sort of study and, and perhaps more social scientific kind of examination of the behavior of researchers in academia with a view to perhaps developing guidelines such as Marua suggested? Um, I'd be interested in your feedback on that. And also, Martin, um, on the harm reduction public campaigns, picking up on Attica's point, is, is there any will within Public Health England, or perhaps you know, enough of your colleagues just to tip it over the edge, to be able to actually get an information campaign going <coughs> for public health, at least for England, if not beyond, um, on this subject to, to counter some of the misinformation? Right. Or okay. is there just not a will okay. to invest in that? Two good questions. Lars. And there was another hand, I saw somebody... I think the there is no phrase that has been uttered okay. so often during these days than harm reduction. And I'm afraid that the uh, meaning of that phrase is not so crystal clear uh, as you might assume, because many people do not perceive 
the meaning of that phrase just as the words taken by themselves in due order would mean, but they take the phrase as an entity, meaning something that could be quite different. I think this phrase as such uh, became uh, common decades ago, primarily uh, in the drug discussion. And then there were a lot of people who uh, connected the phrase harm reduction with drug legalization, which raised very strong feelings. And I think we have a bit of a heritage from the hatred against harm reduction that stems from that area at that age. And now many people will still uh, connect the phrase harm reduction to anything that means not doing the right thing, just doing something less strict, something less valuable. So I think it's important to try to restore the uh, say value of the phrase harm reduction to make people really perceive it as actually meaning what the words say, reducing harm, not something much more, I think the resistance against tobacco harm reduction by, uh, even by governments, as Jean-François was referring to, uh, is an expression of uh, people and institutions who perceive harm reduction as a phrase, as something less than reduction of harm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Jack Hennyfield, then we'll see what the team thinks. Okay, Jack. Thank you. I actually want to build a little bit on Mariwa's comments and Lars' comments. Uh, I think Mariwa uh, summarized, I th think, some powerful feelings and things we have to keep as a foundation going forward. Um, Lars, in turn, the harm reduction, which is something that a lot of us in public health, this is what we do, this is what public health is. But in light of the conversation, let me make a little disclosure on how I got here. It was mentioned, Joe, as the double dark side. Well, I guess I'm the triple dark side because I'm a scientist um, driven to serve public health and who's consulted the pharmaceutical industry thinking we can make a difference there. And I think we have. We've helped make less harmful opioid narcotic analgesics. I'm proud of that. Um, now working with Reynolds on vapor products and nicotine replacement, I'm convinced that in that partnership, we can help move things more rapidly, more quickly, and that's important. But then on the public health side, I get arrows from every direction. I probably contributed to as many reports of our Surgeon General since 1980, National Cancer Institute, World Health Organization, UK Royal College as anybody. So I get it from every direction. But what I've learned is that the problems are diverse. The people that we're trying to serve are incredibly diverse. The, look at the diversity of the tobacco market. It's diverse products to serve diverse needs and diverse desires. Look at the, the diversity of the NRT market. You know, gum, lozenge, vapor, nasal, combination. So now we have something that potentially opens up an incredible new river away from combusted products. That is really exciting to me. So I've had my own migration from being very precautionary five, six years ago to now being really excited that this could be the really big thing and we could be part of one of the biggest public health advances in the 21st century. To do that, though, we've got to work together. We've got to be mutually respectful, civil, collegial. I don't know how we make that happen. This meeting is incredibly encouraging in that regard. The tobacco merchants meeting that I was at a couple of weeks ago was incredibly encouraging. If we're going to get regulators to move in the right direction, they are helped when they see some consistency across different parties. And I think from the perspective of regulating tobacco products in a way that is rational and reasonable and balanced, I think we have that opportunity. I'm more excited about the possibility. FDA, ironically, have, probably has more flexibility than most organizations 
because of a stupid decision a judge made a few years ago saying that these products were tobacco products because they contain nicotine from tobacco, like nicotine patch. Well, um, we called them ends at WHO because they, we said they weren't tobacco, but they were very diverse. And, um, and I think now with the FDA, we've got the right team that understands those issues. If we can get FDA some unified messages about the need that the regulation should foster innovation, you need diverse products to meet diverse needs. You need big players, you need small players. On that front, quick anecdote. My own son, about a year and a half ago, I said, Vincent, I'll pay for your electronic. And, but, I'll t but I'll tell you which ones I'll pay for because I know which ones are relatively clean and deliver nicotine. I said, most people don't know that. They have no basis. I said, he said, can I smoke at any place? I said, well, if somebody around somebody that says they don't like it, um, don't do it. They have no basis. What are you going to do? Tell them your dad says it's clean? And then, he didn't like some of them. Some of them were better. And then Philip Morris, uh, Altria, and Reynolds Views came out. And I said, Vincent, guess what? Reynolds and Philip Morris have products. He said, really? So it kind of opened his eyes. So there are people that I think will gravitate to something that comes from the big players, people that don't want to have anything to do with tobacco companies. Um, by the way, then when I, he said, well, are their products clean? And I, can I use them? I said, what are you going to do? Tell them they're from Philip Morris and Reynolds and that's going to reassure them? I said, Vincent, this is why I'm working on regulation. So we need regulation really urgently, really quickly to reassure people, to reassure reg others, to reassure non-users, and to advance this whole effort to cause one of the greatest public health um, achievements in history. But we've got to work together, and uh, we need more people like uh, Mary Watt speaking uh, to bring more civility to this area. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I just realizing how difficult it is to have five people make several points and try to condense it down into something that's manageable by the panel. But I think what I'd like to do is to talk about some of the science questions. I'm going to look to Linda in a minute. The science, the values, bad science, how to get science done, and so on. And then move on to, um, we could all have a go at that one. And then the second sort of area is, harm reduction, what is harm reduction, differences between drugs harm reduction, tobacco harm reduction, what's the meaning of harm reduction. Third one is kind of good information, and that comes back to some of the science, the good science, the bad science, what do you say to people, what does Public Health England say to people, and then kind of running through all of this again was the kind of points that Jack raised about collaboration, talking, can we actually get it together so we can talk to each other with some uh, respect. So let's deal with maybe the science type questions first and we'll see, we'll go around the, okay. Okay, I mean, I, I think the science question actually has to start with the <coughs> definition of harm reduction question. In an earlier session, David reminded us about what the definition of tobacco harm reduction is and the, the definition we use in the NICE guidance, which is not about tobacco harm reduction as a replacement for other choices people might make about stopping smoking abruptly or whatever. It's an, it's an option, it's a menu of options. You can reduce your harm from tobacco through a range of different choices, and here's what they are. And I think we, many of our colleagues don't understand what harm reduction is and we have to remind them about that very broad definition. And in the science, it's, it's exactly the same. I think the issues around getting the good quality science done, there's many aspects to that. We, we need to work with funders to make them understand what some of the priorities and questions are that need to be addressed. And believe me, most research funders are still very hesitant about this area. <coughs> it would be better if we could have more of them funded good science. And I believe very strongly that our colleagues who from my perspective, don't understand basic statistics or they're not uh, communicating in a way that shows they understand. Exactly, exactly. Um, that's right. That they need to be held to account. Now, my approach to holding them to account is not to respond to them in social media, but to have the meetings with the people who I think are the key decision makers, the thought leaders in your own <laughs> respective countries, and make sure they understand very clearly where things are being misrepresented. I think doing that from a position of some dignity, if you can hang on to it, 
is actually more effective than some of the things some of us have been doing. But critiquing other people's work is crucial, and doing reviews of other people's studies is crucial. So that's something we need to do. And just one final thing. I think that in terms of communicating, trying to fill the information gap, we don't just need the industry, vapors and others communicating what's coming across, but some of the big organizations like CRUK that, that I'm working with now, we're producing a monthly briefing that tries to summarize the studies and give a very sensible overview of what they actually say so the policymakers can see it. We've only done two of them. If anybody's interested, I'll start sending them out. But we need a lot more of that uh, because it's, you know, it's and accountability crucial. I mean, I, I'm an editor of a journal and nobody's ever complained or anything about anything we've published, so we're obviously not publishing anything that's very significant. But um, <coughs> the problem that stuff gets through and then how do you tackle the journal editorial team? You know, how can you get a retraction or a change? And it's incredibly difficult because journals are not accountable. They have all these, these COPE guidelines where you can put forward a complaint, but they just, you know, disregard it if they want to. Anyhow. Uh, Jerry, what I are you going to on three specific issues, and right. unfortunately one for each of your three areas of discussion. So uh, <coughs> the, the first one uh, I want to address in, in relation to the science uh, about what we learned from HIV in the 80s and 90s and, and, and later uh, is that um, we had a lot of different strategies being used all around the world, and, and you know we were talking about. Russia now being the problem with needle exchanges. I remember a time when Russia was relatively good at needle exchanges. It was the United States where we really struggled to convince people about a, a needle exchange harm reduction uh, approach. Well, we have the data. We, you know, there were, there were, there were good interventions uh, that Jerry assessed. There were bad interventions that I ran. Uh, we, we kind of worked out what works and what, what didn't. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, the policymakers had the data, they, and they would make their decisions based on yeah, the filter of values. Um, we can have that with um, with tobacco harm reduction if we allow uh, a diversity of approaches. If we allow people to test the ideas uh, that we might be skeptical about, uh, and, and they allow us to test the ones that we, and then we can engage honestly. We've got good. Uh, international measures like the ITC study that can help us work out uh, what has worked relatively well and relatively what, what has been more problematic. Um, but, but the idea that you know, we should shut down all debate, have a one-size-fits-all approach, um, and, and we, we have enough data now to make a decision about where we go with electronic cigarettes and tobacco harm reduction, no matter what solution you're recommending, that's crazy. So, so, so let, I mean, we're in a situation where we have an opportunity for a national, uh, a natural experiment. Uh, let's see how it goes for a bit. But that means tolerating difference. A couple of points about uh, harm reduction and about uh, politicians. Um, I, I see a number of, of uh, civil servants and, and government bodies being very risk averse, uh, and, and this. Aversion to risk explains largely, I think, the position of WHO. WHO has to respond to member countries, and, and people from the member countries cannot afford to take any, any risk. They, they understand their mission as protecting the minister above them and, uh, uh, and not uh, necessarily defending public health. So we can and we should reverse this. Currently, their position is that it is risky to authorize these products, and the safer solution for them is to prohibit them. We, we, we can reverse this by making it an electoral issue. Much of the time, not all the time, but much of the time politicians win seats by a small margin. And vapors can make the difference. I mean, if all the vapors of both political sides side with a given politician, it may give him the margin to win an election. So this, th then, or her, and then, uh, the risk is not taking into account the opinion of vapors. You have a reversal of the risk for them. It becomes risky not to, d to defend vapors. So this is a possibility. Politicians react to money, to uh, the fear of getting exposed in the media for any scandal and to elections. So we, we, we need to 
use these three tools to make them move. Uh, and oh, okay. <laughs> and about harm reduction, um, I in Switzerland, for instance, in Switzerland we, we vote about just anything. E every month or every couple of months we, we have five to seven objects to vote about and we voted over the past 20 years several times about drug policy. And each time I would say uh, the population voted in favor of harm reduction strategies. They voted in favor of needle exchange, in favor of heroin prescription, the medical prescription by doctors of heroin, uh, injection rooms, and a lot of other things. So um, it's also an issue of power because with these approaches, governments have to release some power. They have to give some power to the users themselves, to the associations of users, to uh, even their political opponents, if, if you want to implement these strategies correctly. So there's also an issue of democracy versus authoritarian regimes, and uh, the more democratic you are, the more changes you have, I think, to implement things that are close to the needs of people, in, in, in this case, harm reduction. You're, you're quiet? Yes, what about accountability? I mean, how do you personally see your accountability? I mean, we talked a lot about accountability uh, to, you know, you, you talked about refugees from accountability, and you consult, provide advice, people paying you for advice, um, but you also kind of got a strong personal vision of what you are about. So how do you play that accountability line? Uh, this will probably sound trite, but I don't know that I've ever asked that question of myself, which may actually reveal a level of shallowness of contemplation and reflection. I, I literally don't, I mean... Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay, good, uh, that, that's good. I, I've never heard him stumped for a few words before. Okay, right, now we're going to take another five questions. I ha my chair is in the wrong direction, so I haven't been looking that way. We've got Lou, I'm sorry, I've got your name, thank you, over there. And um, it's David, okay, three. Uh, uh, the front here, and uh, who's at the back? Yeah. At the back. Sorry. Okay. But let's let's see how we go. Oh, and more coming up here. Let's start with because we're running out of time as so well. Lou. Then. Thank you, Lou Ritter from AIMSA, United States. Um, directly under the concept of on um, the topic of a moral maze, there's something that has been troubling me greatly, and I'd really love to hear the panel discuss this a little bit. Please forgive in a global audience my use of the American example or the U.S. example, but it's what I'm obviously most familiar with. When we're talking about morals in, in this venue, and I see organizations that are advancing themselves as public interest organizations, the American Cancer Society, the American Lung Society, the American Heart Association, um, the CDC, and we're seeing many of these organizations taking very specific, uneducated positions against harm reduction without having an objective, open mind to really research these products and what are the realities, what are the risks, what are the parameters, what do we, don't we know. Um, I see other organizations taking out positions without really recognizing that they do not know what they do not know. We see the CDC putting forth um, twisted presentations of their own data. In, intentionally, I mean very clearly n with knowledge. The other side of the coin that also troubles me is that we seem to have a regulatory process that does not facilitate the regulator's ability to directly pursue information from subject matter experts. We have public comments. We have an NPRM process which skipped over the ANPRM process. The FDA does not seem to be able to directly pursue information when we have knowledgeable subject matter experts within the realm of public policy where you have disinterested parties that are extremely knowledgeable. David Abrams from Legacy, Jeff Steyer in New York, um, myself as a consumer volunteer with no financial industry, uh, Stefan Didek. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's a plethora 
of people who have come forth as obviously extremely knowledgeable with access to direct subject matter experts, and yet the process does not allow the government to seek us out and say, can you get us this information? I've been in front of the FDA four times in listening sessions, and they can only ask us questions about our presentation. And I've said to them over and over again, whatever you need, we will get you. If you tell us what you need to know, we have access to the subject matter experts, and we will come back and present it to you and give you whatever you need, and they're not allowed to ask us. Can you please discuss some of this? Good. Thank you. Uh, here? Hello. I'm Rob Lyons from Action on Consumer Choice. I want to get all philosophical uh, for a moment. Um, I'm a bit concerned about, <coughs> I mean, we're obviously talking about tobacco control, but you know, about control by government in general and what that says about the view of government and other people about the population as moral beings. Because it seems to be, the suggestion seems to be that we are incapable of making moral choices for ourselves and therefore those moral choices need to be taken out of our hands. That seems to me to be quite problematic. And it doesn't, doesn't just affect tobacco, for example. It could be things like parenting, all sorts of things, diet, um, a whole range of different is issues on which this, uh, this notion of control or regulation and taking these decisions out of our hands um, uh, has be kind of been the, the, sort of the framework by which uh, people in authority have, have worked. And I think that's a really big problem. Specifically, well, one specific way in which I think that might be a problem is that it actually makes us kind of morally flabby in ourselves. If we go through our lives and more and more of our moral choices are taken away from us, then we don't have to think morally for ourselves because the issue doesn't come up. So what, what, what do you think about whether control is an appropriate way of dealing with these things and what effect that has on us as moral beings? Thank you. Um, David. Um, to me, I, I think one of the core issues here to, to discuss a little bit is, although it's a small change in wording, and I pick up on what Lars was saying, I do think we should move from harm reduction to harm minimization for a very important reason, and maybe you could talk about this a little bit. We debated long and hard the issue of those two words at the OBSSR where I headed up the, the Institute for Behavioral Science for the United States around minimizing the harm in the sense of reducing health disparities. We don't want to reduce health disparities. We want to minimize and drive to eliminate health disparities. And the issue here is very important because if you say harm reduction, it means different things to very different people, as Lars said. And it, in effect, it allows people to get off the hook in the sense that you can say harm reduction is one cigarette less a day. And it's true to some degree. You could say, I adhere to harm reduction because I will allow medicinal NRT short term <laughs> only for the purpose of smoking cessation, for no other purpose. Those are the two extremes on the continuum. A and they don't get to the point is that harm reduction's not enough. You've got to drive to harm minimization. So I do think that's an important distinction um, to move us forward in common ground because we can debate the degree of harm reduction and get into all sorts of trouble that way, and we are. We cannot debate the issue of harm minimization driving to ideally no harm at all, because that also embraces the old god of tobacco control, which is first and foremost, non-users should not use at all because that's the only way to have zero harm. And then if you are using, for whatever reason, personal choice, recreation, or because you got hooked as a kid and now you can't get off it, you can go to harm minimization. Ideally, don't stop until you're off everything. But if you have to use a lifetime less harmful product, you are still minimizing your harm. You're just not giving up on further reducing it. So maybe a little bit of comment on, on why I think harm minimization calls for more common ground in, in all of the, the people and actually embraces the traditional tobacco control 
community that is, seems to be so against harm reduction. This is taking me back to several decades of work on drugs harm reduction. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to try and take as many as I can. We are running over, and the panel will have a last sort of say, but we'll try and get as many questions in as we can. Um, there's a question there, then there's one at the front, and then, is it Steve? Yeah, at the back, and um, Russell. So, oh, okay, I'll see if I can do everybody, but keep them brief to make it democratic. So, I've, am I? Yes. Up. Okay. I have a very brief comment. I spent a lot of my career on um, tobacco cessation, developing tobacco cessation services to uh, apply at the population level. And um, I think that work is about harm reduction. Um, we don't, ha our best treatment programs, our very best treatment programs are exciting if they have a 50% quit rate. That's harm reduction, actually. That's not um, the, you know, that's not the end game, whatever. So I, I think we have to look at everything in terms of the relative contribution to population health. And I, I just want to second minimization as a much superior word to reduction, harm reduction, because of the traps that we find ourselves in, um, in debates like these with harm reduction. Thank you. Good, thank you. And at the front here, please. Norbert Zillotron, Weber from Germany, from the German users community. And uh, I want to ask about accountability. It's, we have, a, in Germany we have a problem. The media just uh, are very biased. Uh, they told one expert and uh, there was one celebration among the vapors community when we had uh, Dr. Etta in, uh, in an interview on TV, and that was the only uh, positive uh, report uh, on mass media we had all the time. And then how can we, what can we do and what can the scientists do to get more information through the mass media. How can they be held responsible for reporting objectively or at least uh, getting the information out when uh, some of the um, scaremongering is definitely refuted? There's no retraction on uh, mass media usually. So again, questions of accountability and so on. Um, still working? No. Uh, Steve, Chris, that will have to be it, I think, just in the interest of time. I'm very sorry to others who have put in their hands up. OK, yes, yeah, Steve, Stokesbury Imperial. Um, just wanted to say first, you know, that it, it's a, this is a real opportunity coming together and I really appreciate those who've chosen to lay prejudice aside for the sake of trying to understand an issue together. Um, and I appreciate the journey that many of you have taken to get to this point. Um, but we're talking about a number of people outside of this room. Um, Linda, you, you mentioned holding people to account. Um, that are just writing things independently. And John Francois alluded to that as well. Practically, how do we do that? If they won't join a forum like this, how, how, how does that actually work? That, that's, that's really my question. How, how, do we, how do you achieve that with people who want willfully to sit outside of the fence and just, just criticize from outside? Thank you. at the back. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, it's just a question about the, the language we use in research. So this whole meeting and everyone here talks about e-cigarettes in terms of the benefits for people who want to <coughs> quit smoking. But when we do research with people who are motivated to quit smoking, we ask them about their perceptions of the risks of e-cigarettes. 
So we're focused on risk perception rather than benefit perception. So I can understand that asking never smokers what they perceive to be the risks of starting, sorry, <coughs> uh, to use e-cigarettes, but to ask people who are using products we know to be more harmful about their perception of what it might be like to start using a product we know to be less harmful, I think we should be focused more on what they perceive as the benefits of that switch and asking them what they think they would be missing out on if they didn't make the switch, rather than asking them what they'd be risking if they made the switch. Yeah, and of course what... Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, and what researchers and harm minimizers and uh, politicians and public health people really don't get to grips with is um, pleasure. You know, it's not just about reducing harms, but it's about people wanting to do things that, from which they get pleasure and to do them in a rather safer way than they might otherwise do. So I'm not meant to be making comments. Uh, um, <laughs> I've got a... Um, but I'd like the, the panel to just really pick on one issue each. Not all of your points will be addressed, obviously, and I know there are lots of other questions to be asked, but we have to break for lunch in a few minutes. So we just go, Linda. So just very quickly, I agree with Chris. David, if you could write a commentary for nicotine tobacco research on harm minimization, that would be great. Uh, the cancer societies are a very powerful global force, and we really need to work with the cancer societies in particular to encourage them to be more sensible about this agenda. That's one thing I would say. And then the point about holding our colleagues to account. When they write an article, when they comment, we need to come in from a similar position and critique what they've said. And many of us are trying very hard to do that. It's not always easy. You can make several points if you make them as quickly as Linda yeah, does. Yeah, well, I've, I've got, there were <laughs> several that were in there that I haven't yet responded to. Uh, so uh, there was a, a question about what we... Um, well, there was, there was a question about when is PHE going to uh, come off the fence and, and, and have a campaign, uh, and AIDS, you gave us a good example. Bad example, because uh, the, 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 the example of the national campaign, uh, first national campaign anywhere in England, uh, uh, or in the UK, and it was don't die of ignorance. Meanwhile, I was running a, a small gay men's HIV camp, uh, organization, uh, and our messages were so positive so sex positive, pleasure positive, that the, the gay porn mags used to queue up to run our ads for free because they could have uh, images, if they had our logo on it, that they would get shut down for having otherwise. So, so there's, we used to run courses called you know, Bondage for Beginners class, mostly attended by tabloid journalists, I've got to say. But, <laughs> but, so, so there's my tip for, for community activists. Uh, don't go at the speed of the slowest. If you're saying we haven't been not we haven't been loud enough, we haven't been clear enough. We're trying. Obviously, we have to be louder and clearer in in the future. But you know, when I give a, a press quote and say um, electronic cigarettes uh, may not be 100% safe, but they're 95% probably at least 95% safer than smoking, the, the the quote gets into the paper as PHE official says electronic cigarettes not safe. I, I'm sorry, I, it's, that, that's beyond my control. Uh, but, but actually, the first point that was uh, where I was called up was about uh, you know, the, the early lessons from uh, HIV prevention. Uh, and I often quote an Australian academic. She has written to me and asked me to stop quoting it because she claims she didn't say this. Uh, I should quote myself in future. Um, and, and she says, uh, <laughs> uh, the point is not to engage in a doomed quest for objectivity. The point is to be intelligent about our subjectivity. Now, I'm afraid that sounds too postmodern for you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna stand by that because, you know, we, we all have uh, subjectivities which actually are valuable. You know, e-cigarette e e users have a subjective experience which we must value, and I guess researchers do too. Uh, and so when I present data that says uh, from smokers, uh, why, why they don't use electronic <laughs> cigarettes. I promise you, we did ask qu the question the other way around as well about what the perceived advantages were. I, I, I had an important point to make about that, uh, that uh, answer, which is that uh, there were strong, possibly growing perceptions of harm that were stopping people uh, moving away from the most toxic products towards the safer. And actually, that brings us back to the first point, which was the duty of public health bodies to be as honest as we can, as clear and as loud as we can about the evidence as we see it. 
Thank you. Joe? So, as I was, I went to college as uh, thinking I was going to be an applied math major until one semester of multivariable calculus, there was a slope in the amount of time that those remarks took. You do the projection, is it linear or is it second order? So, um, I, apparently I'll be able to put supplemental material up on the conference website. I've made some more notes. So to keep it to one, I'm going to tell a story. And it's a story that, a short story, I will keep it short. <laughs> Um, I had the good fortune of having dinner on Wednesday night with some dear friends. Uh, the server asked, because we were loud and there a long time, asked, what do you do? Health, oh, what, tobacco and nicotine? She says, y you know, I am a smoker, but I have a, a vaping device, but I hear about that we really don't know enough and what could be in this. And what hit me is why did she have to be the server at the table that have Clive Bates edit, <laughs> and she could actually find out some straight stuff. Yeah. That's a tragedy. It is. And where are the outreach workers going out with the e-cigarettes as we had the outreach workers going out with the syringes? Anyhow, um, Jean-Francois, last word. This is a disruptive technology, and like all disruptive technology, we shouldn't be astonished that there is reluctance from those who feel threatened because they will be replaced by something new. But this generates an angry debate. This generates perhaps also a, a debate that is very much misinformed, but we are at the crossroads. It is now that the regulations are being written, and once they are written in many countries, they will be written for many, many years. So it's our responsibility, each of us at, at, at his or our own level, in his or our own position and profession, to contribute to this debate, keeping in mind that uh, the objective is to reduce uh, the number of people who die from tobacco, uh, and, uh, mm. and this is the number one objective. Yes, thank you. Well, with that, uh, we need to break for lunch, and you come back at 1.30 for more good stuff. And uh, I'd like everybody to join in. The panel can thank the audience, and the audience can thank the panel, so we can all clap. <laughs>